The message today is titled, Get Out and Don't Look Back. Uh, would you turn to your neighbor real quick, although you don't even have context yet, but could you just look at them with a smile and tell them, get out and don't look back? Wasn't that awkward? Wait, are, are you all trying to explain yourself right now? Come on, let's get into the word. <laughs> Genesis chapter 19. If you've got Genesis chapter 19, say amen. If you're still trying to figure it out, it's the first book in scripture. Beginning with verse one. The two angels came to Sodom in the evening and Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. When Lot saw them, he rose to meet them and bowed himself with his face to the earth. In verse 2, and this is what Lot said, My lords, please turn aside to your servant's house and spend the night and wash your feet. Then you may rise up early and go on your way. And they said, No, we will spend the night in the town square. In verse 3, But Lot pressed them strongly. Everyone say, Press them strongly. And so they turned aside to him and entered his house, and he made them a feast and baked unleavened bread, and they ate. And I'm going to stop right there and go back a little bit. Now remember, the chapter before 19, Abraham interceded on behalf of Sodom, knowing that he had a nephew that was residing in this particular city. And so it's really simply out of God's mercy, which we will see as we continue to move through this chapter. Out of God's mercy, two angels decided to show up and reach out to Lot. And Lot met them right there at the front of the gate. He recognized they were not just simply ordinary men. He bowed low, recognizing this divine visitation that was actually interrupting his very mundane routine in the midst of darkness. Lot's reverence to God, I don't believe, dismisses his very relaxed posture in the presence of ungodliness. I would like to encourage us, never get caught sitting comfortable in this fallen world without truly being a witness of your faith in Jesus. We've been called to be a light in the dark, not relaxed in the dark. Psalm 1-1 says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. And so, initially, the angels rejected Lot's invitation to rest in his house. This could be seen in some measure as a rebuke for his casual approach to a very wicked community. Lot was, I believe, spiritually flat-footed. And he suggested something prematurely, how they should visit and how they should go and how quickly they should leave. Lot's positioning in the city reveals his life being spiritually lethargic, which sometimes can happen when you're not effectively cultivating change in your community. Spiritual lethargy is, is really what it looks like when there's no spiritual growth. Spiritual lethargy is what it looks like when you're not pursuing spiritual growth. When you've gotten comfortable in your spiritual state without wanting more, without pursuing God's holiness. It's a casual approach to Christianity. It's a casual approach to the word of God. It's, it's, it's you and I pursuing God only when it's convenient. Or maybe only when two angels suddenly show up at your doorstep. And then all of a sudden you decide to show reverence. And all of a sudden you decide to bow low. And all of a sudden you decide to lay out a nice spread. Come into my house. Come, please. This is, you don't want to hang out in my streets. But you know, I'll, I'll take good care of you. And so he makes this effort. 
to show forth a, a good impression, to be able to prove maybe to God and to the angels, I'm okay, I'm good where I'm at. But don't think that if you do enough to look good, you can settle where you're at without yielding to the will of God. Remember, God orders our steps. I don't. You don't. He orders our steps. He orders our steps as a church. He orders our steps in our relationships. He orders our steps in our pursuit of education, our pursuit of career. He orders our steps, and God doesn't miss steps. In church, the Holy Spirit has the authority to redirect our lives. Now let's carry on here. Chapter 19, verse 4, you with me say amen. But before they lay down, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, both young and old, everyone say young and old, all the people to the last man. Are you, are you reading this? All the people to the last man in the city surrounded the house. Not just a few men, not just a couple of bad seeds. The Bible says that every man from Sodom, young and old, surrounded the house. And this is what every man in the city did in that moment. They called to Lot. Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us that we may know them. Lot went out to the men at the entrance. Shut Thank you, my brothers. Do not act so wickedly. Behold, oh Lord Jesus, I have two daughters who have not known any man. I have two daughters who are virgins. Let me bring them out to you and do to them as you please. Only do nothing to these men for they have come under the shelter of my roof. Listen, I, I have a hard time even reading this passage of scripture because it's so repulsive. And his idea to protect the angels is really the evidence of his pride and his lack of trust in God. You see, Lot's failure here is that he didn't believe that God would protect him and his family. So he felt like in this moment, God needed his help in order to order his steps. So he comes up with this disgusting alternative that reflects a lack of discernment and a lack of wisdom. It reflects the spiritual lethargy in his life. When your spiritual walk is shallow, you make bad decisions in the moment of crisis. I'll say it again. When your spiritual walk is shallow, you make bad decisions in the moment of crisis. And very often, you'll make bad decisions when you choose to do life in bad company. I know that's hard. Verse 9. This is their response to Lot. Ah, stand back. You, you came here to sojourn and what? Now, now you're the judge? Now we're going to deal worse with you than with them. Then they pressed hard against the man. Meaning at this moment there was this physical altercation that started to happen right in the door. And they drew near to break the door down. But the men, verse 10, you with me say amen. But the men being angels reached out their hand. That's, 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 that's a moment of mercy. And they brought Lot into the house with them and shut the door. And they struck with blindness the men who were at the entrance of the house, both small and great, both young and old. Every man that was in that city was suddenly blind in that moment. But even in their blindness, they wore themselves out groping for the door, not groping for a way to leave, they were still groping for the door. They continued to reach for the door. They continued to pursue the men because they wanted to sleep with them and have their way. 
they completely dismissed the supernatural intervention of God. They were unwilling to yield to the extraordinary power of God. They continued to reach out in the dark, longing to fulfill the lust of their flesh. And then the angels, verse 12, the men said to Lot, have you anyone else here? Sons-in-laws, sons, daughters, anybody, any family in and around this city? Get them out of this place. For we're about to destroy this place. Because the outcry against its people has become great before the Lord and the Lord has sent us to destroy it. So, so Lot went out and he said to his sons-in-law who were to be married to his daughters, up, get out of this place. For the Lord is about to destroy the city. But he seemed to his sons-in-law to be jesting. Church, it's frightful to think that you can hear the warnings of God and shrug them off as if it were a joke. But this is what we're seeing today. A generation that is corrupt and without shame. But scripture makes it very clear what this looks like. In Romans chapter 1, verse 24 through 25, it says this. This is the word of the Lord. Therefore God gave them up. God gave them up. And the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves. Because they exchanged the truth. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie. And they worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. For their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise, as we just read in Sodom, gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty of their error. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind, meaning a corrupt mind, to do what ought not to be done. This is what we're facing today. It's sobering. But there's still hope in the name of Jesus. Because as sobering as this feels, as weighty as this feels, as I have taken time to look at this, I'm still believing for salvation. I'm still believing for miracles. I'm still believing for lives transformed by the power of the gospel and the goodness of his mercy and grace. God's not done with us, but we have to come out of this shallow state of spirituality. We have to come out of this lethargic approach to giving God our praise and our worship. Church, we have to be all in at this hour. Listen, I got to move on for the sake of time. In verse 15, as morning dawned, the angels urged Lot, saying, up, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, lest you be swept away in the punishment of the city. Hey, don't delay your deliverance. When you recognize God has stepped in to intervene and to move you forward and to move you into something next, do not delay. Don't delay your deliverance. When God shows you the door of escape, you move through it without hesitation. Yes. Yes, we're here in this world. But though we're, we're in this world, we're not of it. And there are moments where God is going to put you right smack in the middle to be a voice and a testimony and a witness. But when God is saying, I need you to pull back, I need you to step away, I need you to move, I need you to get out, don't hesitate when God calls you to step out of something that you shouldn't be in. But look at verse 16. You with me? Say amen. He lingered. But he lingered. 
So the men seized him and his wife and his two daughters by the hand. Here it is. The Lord being merciful to him. And they brought him out and set him outside the city. Oh, if it wasn't for God's mercy, where would we be? You see, that's the power of God's mercy. That even in our stubbornness, that even in our, in our posture of delay, even in those moments where we linger and we're not quite sure whether we really want to move forward because I've gotten kind of comfortable with this and I, I, I understand that things are dark around me, but, you know, we have this practice of always saying, it is what it is. But mercy overrides those moments where you're just saying, oh, I'm good, I'm all right. God, yeah, in my house I'll serve you. Sometimes God is saying, no, I need you to get up and move forward. I need you to get up and get out. And God does not wait for our excuses. Out of his mercy and his grace, we've been saved and set free. That's mercy. That's the cross. 2,000 years ago, God didn't wait around for us to sign the contract for our salvation. He just put things in motion from day one. Son, I need you to go down, put on flesh, and I need you to save them from their sin. And today we're still experiencing the mercy of God, whether you like it or not, whether you want it or not, whether you attempt to resist it or not. There is always mercy that is new every morning. Great is his faithfulness. He's so gracious and so kind and so loving. This is why as a church we have to stay anchored at the cross because it's at the cross we're continually reminded that God's mercy is enough. Mercy of God Get out and don't look back. Stop lingering. Don't lay back when God is calling you forward out of this place of darkness. Let God lead you, church. Some of us exhaust ourselves trying to figure out your next when God desires that you would just go to his word and he's going to lead you into that new place. He's going to lead you into promise. He doesn't fail. Oh, look, 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 look what happens here. And as they brought them out, one said, one of the angels, one of the angels said this. There was a sense of urgency in this moment. Escape for your life. Do not look back. Look to somebody. Tell them again now that you got a little bit more context. Get out and don't look back. The angel said this, do not look back or stop anywhere in the valley. I love this part right here. The angel says this, escape to the hills, lest you be swept away. But here's the problem in verse 18. Lot has the nerve to once again make excuses. And Lot said to them, everybody see it behind me? Oh, 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 nah. Sorry. New York City translation. <laughs> oh, no. My lords, behold, <clears throat> your servant has found favor in your sight. You better believe that lot. You've been given a lot of mercy right now. Why don't you just shut up for a moment and just trust the leading of God? But I'm, but I'm saying, though, I, I, if I found favor in your sight, and, and, and thank you, you've shown me great kindness. You better believe God has shown great kindness. You, you've shown me great kindness in saving my life. I'm just saying what I can't do. I just feel like you need to know what I can't do. As if God doesn't already know what you can't do in the natural. It's amazing how we will make excuses with the can'ts. As if God's unaware of who we are, broken and flawed and failed. Why do you think we have his mercy and grace? If he says to escape and get to the hills, get to the hills. No, oh, I, I, I can't escape to the hills, lest the disaster overtake me and I die. Do you really think that God is rescuing you out of destruction and death only to put you up a mountain where you'll die there? Stop worrying about the unknown when you've got the leading of the Holy Spirit working in you and through you. 
Some of you might be in this moment of, of a crossroads or an intersection in your life and you're going, oh, do, do I go left or do I go right or do I go forward? Do I pursue my education or do I, do I just leave New York City or just, I don't know, do I just get the job down the street? I mean, maybe I'll just, I'll get just a local job down the street. And I'm, I listen, I'm, I'm not dismissing the local job down the street, but if God is calling you to the hills, why would you settle for what Lot settles for? Behold, Lot says, this city is near enough for me to flee. It is a little one. Let me escape there. Is it not a little one? Of course they know it's little. If, if I go to the little place, I'm saved. God does not show us his favor and great kindness so that we can just settle for a little. You hear what I'm saying? He doesn't show us this grace and mercy so that we as his people just settle for a little. He's calling us to the hills. That's why I believe the psalmist wrote in Psalm 121, verse 1 and 2, I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where comes my help? My help comes from the Lord who created heaven and earth. Lot, if you're going to bow your face to the earth when the angels show up, you better put your trust in the one who created the heavens and the earth. Come on, somebody. God is calling you out. You put your eyes to the hills. Do not settle for the little. You and I have not been called into the little. We've been called into something great. We've been called into something extraordinary. We've been called into something supernatural. Some of you might be sitting here like, oh, no, you, you don't understand. I, I've lived many years. I've gone through a lot. I've experienced a lot. What? So what? You just going to settle now for the, for the little just because, because you're afraid to take the climb, because you're afraid to move forward? Is anybody in the house of the Lord willing to trust God and keep moving forward? He said to him, this is the response of the angel. Behold, I grant you this favor also. Mercy. That I will not overthrow the city of which you have spoken. God's mercy. Escape there quickly. Mercy. For I can do nothing till you arrive there. Oh, thank God for his mercy. Therefore, the name of the city was called Zoar. See, here's the problem. Because, because you ask for a little, you're going to get a little. Fine. You want Zoar? You can have Zoar. And you'll never experience what God had for you in the hills. And if you were to continue to read through the rest of chapter 19 into chapter 20, you will find that no good thing came out of Zoar. As a matter of fact, Zoar became a mess for Lot and his family. Why? Because you didn't pray for God to do something extraordinary in the hills. You, you didn't pray. Listen, I, feel, I gotta move on this. It's, it's a matter of trust issues. Jeremiah 17, verse 7 and 8 says this, Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose trust is the Lord. He's like a tree planted by water that sends out its roots by the stream. When you trust the Lord, you're not just a tree planted by water, but your roots spread and you affect the ground that you're on. You affect other people, meaning this, your trust in God determines often the trust that others will have in Christ around you. It's influence and impact that God has called us into. So watch what you pray for. Do not pray for Zoar. Pray for the hills. I lift mine eyes to the hills. He is like a tree planted by water that sends out its roots by the stream and does not fear when heat comes, for its leaves remain green and is not anxious. 
in the year of drought. I wish there were no droughts. But sometimes in life we're going to have a drought. You're going to feel like you're in a desert place. You're going to feel like it's just not working out. You're going to feel like you're, you're going nowhere. But for those that trust the Lord, you don't have to be anxious. For it does not cease to bear fruit. What doesn't cease to bear fruit? You don't cease to bear fruit. When your trust is in God, the Holy Spirit does something in you where even in the drought, fruit is being birthed out of you. Words of courage and boldness and life and salvation and healing, you begin to declare for the hills, declare that the mountain belongs to me in the name of Jesus. Just don't ask for the little. Verse 23, sun had risen on the earth when Lot came to Zoar. Then the Lord rained on Sodom and Gomorrah sulfur and fire from the Lord out of heaven. And he overthrew those cities and all the valley and all the inhabitants of the cities and what grew on the ground. Verse 26, everybody see it? But Lot's wife. Behind him, behind him, look at your neighbor and ask, why was she behind him? Behind him, look back, and she became a pillar of salt. Behind him. I don't know about you, but I want my family walking beside me. I want them to feel and sense my excitement for more. I want them to be just as enthusiastic about Jesus as I am. I want my son and my daughters, I want my wife to be right here on this incredible faith journey, believing God for the hills. I'm telling you, we'd be in trouble as a church if I was dragging my wife along to pioneer soul cry. Because the fact that she's still dragging Lot's wife, walking behind, means that she's not completely all in. She's holding on to some things from the past. She's holding on to this this casual Christianity. She's holding on to the, to the comforts of that old life. She's, she's, not, she's not fully given to what looks foreign and uncertain and unknown. And there's not enough in her to trust God completely. And she sure enough wasn't getting that from her husband. So she dragged. Oftentimes we'll look back because of unhealthy curiosity. Don't allow unhealthy curiosity to hold you back from moving forward. That unhealthy curiosity of just wondering what my ex is doing. So rather than dive into the word today and see where God wants to take me up the hill, I I'm just going to scroll through And before you know it, you've exhausted yourself for the last 30, 45 minutes scrolling through social media because of the unhealthy curiosities, wondering what everyone else is still doing in Sodom. When God is saying, would you just lift up your eyes to the hills? Why are you still connected to this? Why? There's this moment with Lot's wife is so significant and so important as I close that even Jesus referenced it in Luke chapter 17. We're almost done. Twyla, maybe if you could come up. In Luke chapter 17, this is, if we could get there. Likewise, just as it was in the days of Lot, they were eating, drinking, 
buying and selling, planting and building. But on the day when Lot went out from Sodom, fire and sulfur rained from heaven and destroyed them all. This is the word of the Lord. So will it be on the day when the Son of Man is revealed. Church, Jesus is coming back soon. Let's stand apart for the glory of Jesus Christ. See, when you're able to stand outside of darkness, God will equip you and fill you and direct you when you should maneuver and step back into those places and be a light. But first you must be yielded to the leading of the Holy Spirit and his word. Verse 31, on that day, let the one who was on the housetop with his goods in the house not come down to take them away. And likewise, let the one who was in the field not turn back. And then, verse 32, he says this, remember Lot's wife. Who is he speaking to? Jesus doesn't say anything about Sodom. He doesn't even refer to the men and how crazy that was. He's not even talking about Lot in this moment. He just says, remember Lot's wife. What he's expressing here is the heart of the Father to know us, to walk with us, to be a people set apart, to be a people who truly desire to walk in company and in relationship with Jesus, the risen Savior, to know who we are made in his image, to understand the beauty of his grace and mercy, his love that continues to draw us out of that place of darkness. What we're getting here when he says, remember Lot's wife is this, I need you, I need all of you. And if you keep looking back, you become a people divided and not fully committed to my, my calling. And so in this moment, Scripture goes on and says, whoever seeks to preserve his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life will keep it. So what is it that you're still holding on to that you need to let go of? What is it that God is saying you need to turn away from? What unhealthy relationship are you still trying to preserve because of the emotional ties and physical satisfactions that you experience? Get out and don't look back. You see, if you surrender your life to Jesus, you will find life. If you attempt to hold on to things in your own strength, you will find yourself being torn between the pursuit of holiness and the pursuit of this world. I know that this message ends a little bit in, very, in a very weighty and, and somber way, but that's okay. We're not always gonna hoop, holler, and, and shout at the end of a message. What's important here at Soul Cry is that we're getting the word of God and that we be a people who recognize that it's no longer I that live, but Christ Jesus who, who lives now inside of me. And so I, I died to this flesh daily, daily. And God gives us the mercy and the grace to be able to die to this. This flesh, these, these thoughts that, that, that we wrestle with, and these emotional feelings that we get, this, this constant tug at my heart to just go down roads that I shouldn't be going down, to, to, to dive into things that I shouldn't be involved with, and to be engaged with stuff that I should not be touching anymore. Because uh, my, my body, it's, it's, the, it's the temple of the Lord now, and his spirit dwells inside of me, and I don't want to create offense with my loving father. And so I, I don't, listen, he's, please, don't misunderstand me. God is not in, not in this posture now where if you turn, he's going to turn you to a pillar of salt. But what I am telling you is this. 
because of his love and his mercy towards us, it should cause you to run for the hills. If you would but just truly understand the beauty of the gospel, it's his desire that you would just understand how much you are loved. And the more I continue to pursue his holiness and the more I continue to pursue Jesus and his truth and the more I continue to yield to the Holy Spirit, I've got no desire to look back over my shoulder. I've got no desire. I, I, I've lifted up my eyes to the hills. And I'll just say this. We, we find ourselves looking back for a number of reasons. Maybe the job you had before now was actually just so much better. And you're still trying to figure out how you got let go. How in the world did I get fired? And it's just, uh, maybe for some of you, you, you know, you, you were just, financially maybe you were in a better place. And now, now there's been this struggle. And, and because of just so many different variables, different circumstances, we do tend to look back. But if you would trust God, there's something better that he has for you that's back there. It only gets better in Christ. He's a good God. He's writing the story. Every chapter gets better in him. Yeah, there's going to be drought moments, but there's victory in the name of Jesus. Head to the hills. Don't look back. Trust him to keep leading you and moving you forward in the name of Jesus. Would you stand up with me? Oh, Jesus. Oh. You know, yeah, here's what's so beautiful about this story the scripture says that that God remembered Abraham and sent Lot there's a clear distinction there he remembered Abraham and he sent Lot he remembered his promises to Abraham he remembered his pro promise to make him a father of many a covenant relationship to never leave him nor forsake him. To bless him going in and going out. To bless his children. You know, we've been given a new covenant. It's Christ the Savior who went to the cross and died for our sins so that we might have life and life more abundantly. It's, we have a new covenant. It's for every person who admits their sin, every person who says yes to Jesus, every person in here who says, I believe, I believe Jesus is the Savior. I believe he came and, and put on flesh. And I believe he went to the cross and died for me. I believe he rose again on the third day. There's a new covenant, and that new covenant says you can declare him as Lord and Savior, and he is going to keep you, and he's going to remember you. He's not just going to send you to the hills. He's going to remember you. It's the same promise that was given to Abraham. That promise is for us today. So let's get out. You don't have to look back. There's something in the hills for you. When I look around and I see you standing here, Tara, this church represents the hills represents the hills it represents the hills of promise it represents the hills of God's mercy the hills the hills the hills belong to you lift up your eyes to the hills lift up your eyes to the hills For anybody here, maybe at least a portion of this message has blessed you, has ministered to you, I want to open up the front here for God's people to step out, to get out, and to believe today that you are going to move forward 
you are going to step up into the hills and you don't even know what it looks like, but you're going to trust God and he's going to be faithful and you're not going to have to look back. And maybe we need to exercise those steps this afternoon. Maybe you need to step out of your seat. You need to get out of the road that you're in and you just come here. I'm just, listen, I haven't even called the worship team to come up because I'm just going to right now just have Twyla maybe just sing something, just play softly. But the rest of our few minutes here belongs to you and your heavenly father. And the word of the Lord for you today is get out. Get out. Lift up your eyes to the hills. There's so much better. Yes, there's better. Hallelujah. Now, Lord God, I pray that as I get out of the way, Pray that this would be a turning point for your sons and daughters. God, may we lift up our eyes unto you. We lift up our eyes to the hills. From where comes my help? My help comes from the Lord. My help comes from the Lord. You created heaven and earth, and so here on this earth, God, reign. Your kingdom come now. You come now and meet us right where we are. In the name of Jesus, get out of your seats. Right now.